Father in heaven, we're thankful for this opportunity to be able to gather together as the body of Christ. And having Christ as our head, we humbly bow in submission. And God, we ask for you to attend to the preaching of your word with power and anointing. That you would fill your messenger with your spirit. And that we would hear from you, O Lord. I pray for every mind to be attentive, for every ear to listen, for every heart to be receptive. And I pray that we would receive the word of God as the word of God and not as the word of man. We ask you these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite you to go ahead and open your Bibles this morning to Luke. Luke chapter 1. As we continue a new Christmas series entitled, Jesus, the subtitle for this morning's message is, What Child Is This? That's the answer we're going to, or question we are going to answer this morning. What child is this? Our passage will be Luke chapter 1, and starting there in verse 26, and we are going to make our way through uh, verse 38. However, the main portion of our message today We'll deal with verses 32 and 33. Here's what the Word of God says. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city called Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man who was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, And tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom, there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative, Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with, uh, with her who is called barren. For nothing is impossible with God, Mary. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Most of us in here this morning know this name, John Newton, the author of Amazing Grace. John Newton was a rough, dirty sailor with a foul mouth and an appetite for rotten living before he came to know Christ. (laughs) He hated life and life hated him. He was a captain of a slave ship. Then someone placed in his hand a copy of Thomas Kempis, The Imitation of Christ. And he read it. He also had the gift of a good mother who told him about Jesus even from the time when he was young. And then he was saved. After his salvation, he went all over England sharing his faith well past the age of retirement as an old man. He would have to have an assistant go with him as he traveled from pulpit to pulpit on Sundays preaching the word of God, old in age, nearly blind, and spoke with a whisper. But nothing could keep him from preaching while he still had breath. One Sunday, while delivering his message, he repeated the sentence, Jesus is precious. Jesus is precious. His helper whispered to him, Oh, Mr. Newton, you've already said that twice. Newton turned to his helper and said loudly, Yes, I have said it twice, and I am going to say it again. Jesus Christ is precious. 
I come this morning to remind all of us that Jesus Christ is truly precious. And that is the purpose of this series through Christmas entitled Jesus. To remind us of just how truly precious Jesus is. Think about this for a moment. In Jesus, we have a love that can never be fathomed. A life that can never die. A righteousness that can never be tarnished. A peace that can never be understood. A rest that can never be disturbed. A joy that can never be diminished. A hope that can never be disappointed. A glory that can never be clouded. A light that can never be darkened. A purity that can never be defiled. A beauty that can never be marred. A wisdom that can never be baffled. Resources that can never be exalted. We have that in Jesus. And we have here in these verses the announcement of the most marvelous event that's ever happened in the world. The incarnation, the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is a passage that we should always read. And when we read it, it ought to be read mingled with wonder and love and praise. There are several things that I want us to notice in this passage. The first thing I would like for us to notice, number one, is the lowly assuming manner in which Jesus came into the world. The lowly assuming manner in which Jesus came into the world. As a matter of fact, if you look there at your Bibles, it says in verse 26, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city called Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man who was Joseph. The angel who announced his birth was sent to an obscure town of Galilee called Nazareth. Also, the woman who was honored to be the Lord's mother had a very humble manner of life. She was poor, a poor teenage girl. J.C. Ryle says this about this passage. He says, we need to realize the wise providence of God in all his arrangement. He orders all things in heaven and earth. He could have chosen Nazareth, or he could easily have chosen the daughter of some rich scribe to be the Lord's mother. As a poor woman, the first coming of our Lord was to be one of humiliation. He says, and I agree with Ryle, the Lord could have chosen any city. He could have chosen any person. He could have chosen a more well-known city he could have chosen a rich girl but he didn't he chose an obscure city and he chose a poor girl what's the purpose to point to us the lowly manner in which Christ came into the world it points to the humiliation of Christ Christ was poor Let us be aware, beware of despising poverty. I'm going to let that one sink in for a moment. Let us beware of despising prov- poverty in others and of being ashamed if God so lays poverty on ourselves. This is the condition for which Jesus voluntarily came into the world. We we live in a society today where poverty is despised and being poor is looked down upon. And if any of us at any moment are poverty stricken or poor, we would feel ashamed. But not so our Lord. In our culture today, we despise the poor and bow down to the rich. But let us remember this morning that the creator of all things, the very king of glory, chose to come into this world through the womb of a poor virgin girl. And he himself being born into poverty, no room for them in the end. Born in the little town of Bethlehem in a cow trough. All we can do, beloved, is to 
really set back and admire the amazing humiliation of Christ. He says there, in the sixth month of the angel Gabriel, he was sent from God to a city called Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man. What more humbling means could there be for the very God who created all things to come into the world? So please take note of the lowly, assuming manner in which Jesus came into the world. As we answer that question, what child is this? Think about this. St. Gregory said, speaking of Jesus, He began his ministry by being hungry, yet he is the bread of life. Jesus ended his earthly ministry by being thirsty, yet he's the living water. Jesus was weary, yet he is our rest. Jesus paid tribute, yet he is the king. Jesus was accused of having a demon, yet he cast out demons. Jesus wept, yet he wipes away tears. Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver, yet he redeemed the world. Jesus brought as a lamb to the slaughter, yet he is the good shepherd. Jesus died, yet by his death he destroyed the power of death. So even in those statements, we see the utter condensation of Christ, the humility of Christ, the poverty of Christ, and, and, the, and just what Christ chose for himself. A practical application is that which I've already told you. If you are a person who despises the poor or judges them quickly, let the birth of Christ be your rebuke. Because that is how he came into the world. This Christmas season, let us remember the poor. Jesus says, You shall always have the poor among you. They shall not be despised. They should be honored. Because it reminds us of Christ and His humiliation. So we first see in this passage the lowly, unassuming manner in which Jesus came into the world. Who is this child? We know He's humble. Secondly, I would like for you to take notice the glorious, awe-inspiring account of the way Jesus was announced. Look, we go on to read, the angel Gabriel appears to Mary, and in verse 28, he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Now here we go. Notice the glorious, awe-inspiring account of the way Jesus was announced. Here it is. He will be great. Do you see that there in verse 32? He will be great. Every aspect of this announcement has deep meaning. And we ought to pay close attention. We know that Christ is great. Why? Because he has provided for us a great salvation. The Gabriel said he will be great. He will die upon the cross for the sins of the world. And he will save people to the uttermost from every tribe, tongue, language, and nation. He will be great. He will be greater, a greater prophet than that of Moses. And he will be greater, a greater high priest than that of Aaron. He shall be great. For he is the prophet, the priest, and the king. Notice what Gabriel went on to say. He shall be great, and he shall be called the Son of the Most High. Jesus was the Son of the Most High before he came into the world. He's equal to the Father. He has always been equal to the Father throughout all of eternity. 
He says, he shall be great, and he shall be called the Son of God. Gabriel is saying, the very one who is, com- who is coming, the very one that you are going to give birth to, is God incarnate. The second person of the triune Godhead. The one who is infinite and eternal. The one who is transcendent. He is high above us. He is other than us. He is all-powerful, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, sovereign, providential, king of kings, lord of lords. The very one who spoke the world into existence. The very one who hung the stars in the sky, knows the galaxies, and the number of hairs on the heads of every man, woman, and child. The one who provides for the lilies of the field, the birds of the air, and calls the deer to give birth in the wilderness. Who provides for the fish of the sea. The very one who created you and me. The eternal son of God will come into your womb And be born from you. Can you imagine God being in the womb of a woman? A poor teenage girl? Can you imagine God being born in a manger? The very one who spoke the world into existence and hung the stars in their place. He shall be great. He shall be called the son of the most high God. We see the glorious, awe-inspiring account of the way Jesus was announced. We saw the lowly manner and the lowly manner points us to his humility. Now we see his majesty. Notice what he goes on to say. And the Lord shall give him the throne of his father David. He'll reign. He's coming to usher in the kingdom. The king is coming and he's coming through you. And through his coming, his first coming, he will usher in the kingdom of God. And one day, ultimately, his kingdom will be realized when he returns for a second time. So we look and we saw the lowly manner by which he came, pointing to his humility. And now we see the glorious, awe-inspiring account of the way Jesus was announced. He is majestic. Awe-inspiring. We abuse this word. This word should only be reserved for God. Do you know what word it is? Awesome. We say awesome about everything. But there's only one who is awesome. And it's God. It's Jesus Christ. So we saw the lowly manner by which he came. We saw the glorious account by which he was announced. And then number three, we see, I want you to take notice of the powerful, eternal majesty of Jesus' glorious reign. I know that's mouthful, but that's the way the Lord told me to give it to you. The powerful, eternal majesty of Jesus' glorious reign. Look at what he says. He shall be called great. He shall be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord shall give him the throne of his father David. Look here, verse 33. And he will reign over the house of Jacob for how long? Forever. And his kingdom, there will be no end. Hallelujah. The kingdom of Jesus shall have no end. Before his glorious kingdom, the empires of the world will fall. They will go down. And they will pass away. Great nations and cities like Nineveh and Babylon and Egypt and Tyre and Carthage. They shall come to nothing. One day, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of Lords and 
king of kings. Make no mistake, the kingdom is now. But the ultimate realization of that kingdom will take place at Christ's second coming. There's no reason for us to be ashamed of our master. Maybe in the first part of this message, we might think, shame. To think that we follow someone that was born in such poverty, poor, had no place to lay his head. What kind of Messiah, what kind of master, what kind of God, what kind of Lord? But we see now there's no reason for us to be ashamed of our master. You see, because we are on the conquering side, just as he is. Notice what these verses teach us. That Christ came, he's humble, he's majestic, he's king. And right now, we carry our cross as we follow him. Indeed, we do. We carry our cross as we follow him. But we also realize that one day that Christ will return and our crosses will be put away and we shall receive crowns. Because just as Christ came lowly and humble at his first coming, he will come as a conquering king at his second coming. But as we carry our crosses today, let us not forget, even though we may suffer today, let us not forget that we are a part of the kingdom now. Therefore, we should live like it. I ask you a question. We look at these verses and we answer that question. You remember the question? What child is this? What's the answer? He is the humble, majestic Son of God, who rules and reigns throughout all of eternity. That's who this child is. What's the proper response to him? There's only one proper response, and that's worship. We are to worship him. In the birth narratives, we see the shepherds coming to worship. We see the wise men coming to worship. But even in this passage of Scripture, we see the young, poor, teenage girl worship. She says, how can this be? He says, verse 37, for nothing will be impossible with God. Mary responds in worship. She says, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. And then notice the Magnificat, verse 46. Notice her worship. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me holy is his name his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation he has shown strength with his arm he has scattered the proud in their thoughts of their hearts he has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate he has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty he has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy and as he spoke to our fathers to Abraham and to his offspring forever and Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home do you see the worship that's the only proper response. What child is this? He is the humble, majestic king who rules and reigns throughout all of eternity. And our response to him must be the same as Mary's. We must worship him. Why? Think about these thoughts as we answer that question. We know who he is, but why worship him? Here's some thought-provoking truths. Christ for sickness, Christ for health, Christ for poverty, Christ for wealth, Christ for joy, Christ for sorrow, Christ today and Christ tomorrow, Christ my life and Christ my light, 
Christ for morning, noon, and night. Christ when all around gives way. Christ my everlasting stay. Christ my rest and Christ my food. Christ above my highest good. Christ my well-beloved friend. Christ my pleasure without end. Christ my Savior. Christ my Lord. Christ my portion. Christ my God. Christ my shepherd. I his sheep. Christ my soul. It is his to keep. Christ my leader. Christ my peace. Christ hath wrought my soul's release. Christ my righteous divine. Christ for me, for he is mine. Christ my wisdom. Christ my meat. Christ restores my wandering feet. Christ my advocate and priest. Christ who never forgets the least. Christ my teacher. Christ my guide. Christ my rock and Christ I hide. Christ ever living, ever living bread. Christ his precious blood had shed. Christ bought me nigh to God. Christ the everlasting word. Christ my master. Christ my head. Christ who for sins hath bled. Christ my glory. Christ my crown. Christ the plant of great renown. Christ my comforter on high. Christ my my hope draws ever nigh. Praise the Lord. And that's who he is and that's why we worship him. Because he's everything to us. He's everything. Listen to me, beloved. When Christ returns a second time, Every earthly pursuit and possession will appear vain. It will be indifferent whether you are rich or poor, successful or disappointed, admired or despised. But what is important is that you have, listen, what is important is that you have mourned for sin. What is important is that you have hungered and thirsted for righteousness. What is important is that you have loved the Lord with sincerity. What is important is that you have gloried in His cross. What is important is that you have invested into his kingdom. Worship him. Mourn over sin. Hunger and thirst for righteousness. Love the Lord with sincerity. Glory in the cross and invest in his kingdom. I've said it twice and I'll say it again. Jesus Christ is precious. Thomas Brooks said, Christ, a jewel more worth than a thousand worlds, as all know him, have him, get him, and get all. And those who don't have him, miss him, and miss all. Is Christ precious to you? Do you have him? Charles Spurgeon said, the seed is choked in our souls whenever Christ is not our all in all. So the question today, is Christ precious to you? We know who he is, the humble, majestic king who reigns throughout all of eternity. And he's coming again. And he is seeking for true worshipers. Is he precious to you? Is he your all in all? If so, then praise the Lord. If not, then he can be this morning. As his arms are outstretched, and he's welcome to receive, or he's willing to receive, all who come to him, by grace through faith. I want to ask if you would to bow your heads with me this morning.
Perhaps you're unsure of your salvation, or you know you've never trusted in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You say, Pastor, I want to. I know that I need to. Then I would plead with you right now. I would implore you. I beg you to surrender your life to Jesus right now as your personal Lord and Savior. He is the humble, majestic, glorious King who reigns forever and ever throughout all of eternity. And the only proper response is to worship Him. And you do that first by surrendering your life to Him. So would you pray something like this quietly in your heart to the Lord? Lord God, I know I need you because I've sinned against you. And I know that the wages of sin is death. But I also know that the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And I know that you demonstrated your love for me, that, that even though I'm a sinner, Christ died for me. You also tell me in your word, Lord, that if I confess with my mouth, and I do, if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, and I say it now, Jesus is Lord. And if I believe in my heart that God has raised him from the dead, and I do believe, then I will be saved. So Lord, I come to you now in repentance and faith, trusting in Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. Here in a moment, I'm going to ask everyone to stand. And if you prayed this morning to trust in Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, would you walk up and let me know, let Jerry know, one of our other pastors, and let us know about your decision today so we can pray with you. Others, maybe you just want to come to the altar and kneel before the Lord. Maybe you've had a wrong view towards the poor or those in poverty. And you just want to come bow before the Lord and say, Lord, forgive me. Or maybe you just want to come and worship Him. Bow before your king, your humble king, your majestic, glorious, eternal reigning king, and just worship him. Whatever the Lord leads, you obey. Lord, we commit this time to you right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and come as the Lord leads?